of fire by night and cloud by day. And it took the places that they weren't the best of places. They were desert places and mountainous places, but they were following what? God. God. And that's what we're talking about in Galatians. We're talking about following the Spirit. Remember what uh, Paul said, if you what, walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the, the lust of the flesh. But the aspect that the Spirit of God is with us, He's with us all the time. And how do we know that? Because he said it. And that sometimes that's hard to comprehend that no matter how things seem, and I, and I brought this illustration out before, but I think it's good to, that we often think about this. If God tells you that, that this, is, this is not green, now, and, and your senses are telling you that it is, here's the aspect. That from what God is telling you, somehow or another, this is not green. Now, it's a poor example because what I'm trying to get you to see is that no matter what God says, it is. Because God is God. God does an all. But if the devil says, this is green, and you look at it, even if you look at it and you seem to think it is green, but the devil is telling it to you for the purpose of what? Deceiving you. So you still can't even when it seems like the devil is telling you something that's correct, you still cannot, what, agree with him. No. And even when God is telling you something that seems like it's not correct, he is still always, what, right. always right. He is never wrong. So in our lives, a lot of times, it seems like things are not the way the, you know, the scripture and the word and the way the, the Lord is telling us through the spirit of God in his word, uh, it's the way it should be. But God cannot lie. If you follow the Lord, it is how he says it is, no matter how it may appear to us. And sometimes that's really hard to really just grasp on a daily basis all the time because we want to believe that the things are doing well and we can see they're doing well. You know, when we good health, and, you know, good wealth and good family and and, and good social structures and, and all that kind of stuff, then we, oh, yes, God is real. <laughs> when you can't pay your bills and, you know, you're not feeling good in your body and, and family members acting all right, you know, God is still real. He's still real. Right? And so that's the part sometimes is more difficult for us. And then we get people that try to tell us. And this is where we get into, like, what we're dealing with right now with Galatians, where people will change and alter. They'll tell you, well, you... Excuse me, you know God is real when you start being blessed. <clears throat> when you start having all these wonderful blessings and when all these things fall upon you, that's how you know that you're walking right with God because you got all this money and you got all this. And so we have to be careful. All right? God says what he says and it's not going to change no matter how anybody else tries to interpret it, no matter how it looks, no matter how it seems, it's always the way God says it is. And uh, so that's why the Bible tells us the only way we can believe that we have to, we've got to stop walking by sight, sight and walk by what? By faith. All right. So then we've got to have faith. But then the Bible also says it is impossible with, to please God with, without faith. Without faith it is. So therefore you cannot walk in the spirit. You cannot follow God unless you have an, an aspect of faith. And then when that man came to Jesus, up talking to him about his son that was sick, and, and Jesus says, do you believe? And that man said, Lord, I believe, but help my what? My oh, unbelief. unbelief. And there's, there's, he's like, Lord, I believe who you are, but I have to admit that sometimes I get confused in my mind. You ever did that? You just mm -hmm. like, I know who God is. I know what the Bible says. But sometimes it's just, I just can't put the, math, spirit, the spiritual math together. It don't seem to make sense in my brain. So God help my, 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 my unbelief or my confusion or my whatever the case may be. And sometimes we got to pray that kind of a prayer because it don't make a whole lot of sense a lot of times because we're following the spirit and the spirit don't follow the rules of the natural man. So in order to follow the spirit, you're going to go through periods, through valleys, through areas that don't seem sensible to you. It just seems like, I don't know why this is happening the way it is. Because we would expect things to be a certain way if God is with us. Mm -hmm. If God is with me, I'm supposed to be 
You know, and then you can fill in the blank, whatever it is that you think you're supposed to have. But not always, not necessarily. God brings you to places, and God brought them people out of Egypt through that Red Sea to a place where they didn't have no water, they didn't have no food. But God also did what? He gave them what from heaven? Man. Manna. And gave them <coughs> water out of a rock. Wow. Out of a rock. Now, who thinks water could come from a rock? All right. But God, God knew. He was able to do it. God is the greatest chemist there ever was. And so if this oxygen and, and, and hydrogen in the rock, he knows how to make them come together and flow like a, like a stream. Mm -hmm. All right, so we, we, we're saying all that because in Galatians, we see that people, uh, we, we've been studying this, and we see how people want to change the gospel and make it so that you can't just accept Jesus for, as your Savior and let that be it. But they say you, you have to do other things. And so what they were trying to tell you, you got to take on the Mosaic law, which is not correct. Scripture says all you got to do is believe in the Lord and you shall be what? Saved. But they say, no, you got to believe in the Lord and plus you got to take on the, the, the right of circumcision. You got to also do this. And we do that today. People tell you, well, in order to, believe, to get saved and go to heaven, you got to believe in Jesus, but then you got to get baptized or you got to speak in tongues or you got to do. And they, got, they put all this other stuff to it. Which is not what the scripture said, as far as being picking on the righteousness of Christ. So we're in our last chapter now in Galatians. So let's go ahead and take a listen to that, and let's see what uh, the Lord would have us to hear uh, in this last chapter book. six. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. All right, so there we go. The uh, last chapter of the book of Galatians. All right, let's get back here and let's take a look at what he is saying here as he concludes this book. And, um, and remember, um, as we had stated earlier, he was starting off and he was explaining to them how you have to hold fast because he kept saying why did you, you you started well why did you change you were going good but then something came and stumbled you you were on the right path but then you got you mixed it up with something bad you know you ever have something that, that starts off kind of good and then the next thing you know you, you, you tweak it all right yeah. you you working on a on something and you, you're putting uh you're tightening a screw or not with the wrench and you think it's tight enough but then you say I want to get that one extra little tight and what happens you do what you, you break it you wrench it right off you got to know sometimes that you know there's certain times when it, it, it's good go with what it is now what Paul is telling the Galatian church 
is that you already had the truth. You had it already. And the truth is as simple as it can be. You don't have to get it complicated. What we have a lot of times today is situations where people like to be deep. Right? They want to be profound. They want to be sophisticated. They want to be intellectual. You know, they want to have all that aspect about them. And so they, they, they go into things and they make it a whole lot more complex than what it is. Salvation is extremely simplistic. You recognize yourself as a sinner that you cannot save yourself. And then you recognize that Jesus is your what? Savior. Is your Savior. He died for you. So, now, what do I do with my righteousness? I do nothing. I give it to the Lord. Well, how do I stand before God if I don't have righteousness? I take on what? The righteousness that is given to me by Jesus Christ. That's how I stand before God. So if God wants to call you, say, well, what, what right do you have to be in heaven? And you say, I have no right but the right that was given to me by Jesus. That's the only right I have. I can't stand. No matter how good you think you are, but also, here's the thing, no matter how bad you are. See? And so it's important to keep in mind, there's a lot of good people that do nice things that don't know Jesus that's going to stand before God and say, well, I was a good person. That's not going to do it. It's not going to cut it. You've got to stand before the Lord in the righteousness of, of Jesus. And so this is what Paul was, was teaching this Galatian, Galatian church. But then people came and taught additional things to what Paul was teaching. And so there, therein is, in a nutshell, is what Paul was trying to get them to understand. So he finishes up here and he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. So now he's going into kind of like, Christian one on one, which is kind of a good lead because when we get into the next book, which is Ephesians, that's really Christianity one on one. We talked about the basis of salvation in Romans, um, how to mature yourself in Galatians, some more basis and simplicity of salvation in in uh, in Galatians. But then, when we get to Ephesians, we're going to be discussing what it takes to just get. Living on a daily basis, just an everyday basis. You know, what does it take? And um, so he's already kind of given us a, 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 a head in, in this where he says, Now, brethren, uh, Galatians 6 is where we are. He says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye that are spiritual, restore such a one. And the spirit of meekness, considering what thyself, lest thyself also be tempted. Now, I want you to keep this in mind because as we go through through this this chapter, it's going to look and sound like Paul's contradicting himself. All right, I'm going to show you something. And you're going to be like, actually, we can go there now. Now, he says, brethren, ye, if a man be overtaken in the fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Go down to the fifth verse. Look at the fifth verse. Look at what he says there. He says. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now, doesn't that it kind of sound like a contradiction? People like to take and say, well, if Paul says that we are to bear each other's burden, we are to help each other, somebody that is overtaken in the fault, but then he says bear, each man ought to bear his own burden. And so the difference in here is the aspect of a person uh, being overtaken and, and they which are spiritual. See, from a spiritual standpoint, nobody, none of us, can do it alone. Which is why God told us that we should do what? We should come together. You should find people that think and, and believe like you do and share, just like what we're doing. What did the scripture say? What Jesus says? He said, where one person is, there I am in the midst. Mm -hmm. He didn't say where one person. What did he say? Where what? Where there's two or three. See? And that's the key. You, you, you have to be able to share because the aspect of what God did, he didn't just die to make your life wonderful. He died to save humanity. And that person to your left or to your right is who God died for. The person at your job, the person that you meet, the person that's in that car in front of you. Those are the people that Jesus died for. And if you despise them, you're despising what he absolutely what? Loves. So that's why it's, it's hard for us. We got to be careful when we when we have venom for for things 
that God loves. And we gave the example on a couple of weeks ago, and it applies here, that there's no need for me to say that, you know, hey, with, I, I, you know, me and him are good friends, but then at the same uh, uh, breath, I say, but I can't stand his wife. Now, can me and Haywood have a, a, can I be really his buddy at the same time and at the, say I can't stand his wife? That can't happen, can it? Because in order for me and him to be good buddies, I also have to love and appreciate his wife. And so it's the same thing with, with God. You say, I love God, but I can't stand the thing that God absolutely died for. And that's other people. That's who he came to. So, so we got to have love. That's why the Bible tells us to love your what? Yeah. And also to love your enemy. Your enemy. You see? Because you can't hate what God loves. You're disagreeing with God. So it's important. We do have to love our neighbor. We do got to love our, our, our people that, that are lovable. But we also got to have love. Right? But remember, what did the Bible say? God... God so loved the world. Right. But he also, that, that's true, but he also said that whom God loveth, he what? Chases. Chases. Now here's an aspect where we have to keep in mind. If God loves you, he will correct you. That's what chastening means. And, and so what people try to use against you, they try to throw the Bible at you. Well, if you're a Christian, God said you're supposed to love me, so you're supposed to give me what I need. No, 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 no. The Bible also says that God, whom God loveth, he chases it. So therefore, me being hard or difficult, because see, a lot of times people say, well, if you're going to love your neighbor and love your enemy, then you're going to have to disagree with him. No, you chasing them. You correct, you discipline, you do all the proper things in love. I'm doing this because you need help, even though you don't know it. So you, you, you see how all of that kind of... It, it, it's helpful to understand. You can do it without being a doormat. You can love your enemy without letting your enemy, what, take advantage of you. Because you can say, no, brother, I'm helping you here. You might not understand it, but uh, I don't want you around my family because you are, you are this, so you are that. And that's chasing it. Or, and so there's, a, there's aspects of strength, you know, like we gave that the we talked about the, the fruits of the spirit. We talked about that word meekness, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's the same thing. A Doberman pincher, you got a pet Doberman pincher and the little boy, little girl is just flopping all over the dog. That's a ninety pound Doberman pincher. And he's pulling his ears and digging in his eyes and everything in the Doberman pincher because he recognized that as being a family member lets the lets the kid pull on him and jumps on his back and everything. But is the Doberman Pitcher doing it because he's helpless to stop that kid from pulling his ears? No. That Doberman Pitcher can stop that kid in a minute from pulling his ears. But do you know the Doberman Pitcher is just being meek towards the child? Because when a stranger, a burglar come in that house that don't belong in there, what happens? It's all over. So you see how all these things, people try to, try to take, well, you're supposed to love, you're supposed to be meek, and you're supposed to... As saying, well, you're supposed to let me just walk all over you. No. Don't mistake me because I'm letting, you know, I'm letting this guy pull on my ear who I know knows no better because he's a child. But, brother, when you cross that line, you're going to see my teeth. In love, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you're going to see my teeth. You know, that's what the Doman Pinchy said. All right, so though all of those aspects, so when we bear one another's burdens and help each other spiritually, we do that from an aspect of love for one another, how God sees love, not how this world tries to interpret love. But then the, also, the Bible also says that every man ought to bear his own burden because you're supposed to carry what you can carry. And God knows what you can do. So it's, it's what's called um, checks and balances. We're supposed to help each other when they get to the point where they cannot what? Help themselves. But when you're able to help yourself, you're supposed to carry your own burden. Your own burden. See, it's not something that contradicts. It actually connects. It, it flows together. They, they work in, co in, co in cohesion with each other. All right? So um, I just think we kind of get that because a lot of times people try to say the Bible contradicts itself. And they point little stuff out. And this is one of the things that people like to point out. There's a lot of things that people try to, well, what about this and this? And the reality of it is if you really think it through, give it some time, 
and look at what Paul is actually talking about, which is why it's nice to go through the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because then you get a full understanding of what's being said. All right. So he says, uh, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of what? Meekness. We talked about that, right? Have compassion on them. All right. So, do you? You may have to allow the person to kind of pull on your ear a little bit and just say, "All right, all right, I'm gonna let it happen because you don't know no better." Or the same meekness, you may have to show him some what? Some, some teeth. You may have to growl at him a little bit. Some some people you restore by just overlooking all their faults. Other people you restore by biting them in the butt. You know, so, so to speak, like the Dolman Pinson would do. You got, you got to go after. But it's all still under the qualification of what? Meekness. All right. And so, all right, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. All right. Some people, you got to get in their face and go like, look, yo, man, you know, this, this, that, and this. Other people, you got to go, listen, man, you know, you got to pat them on the back, give them some tissues, you know, all that kind of. I mean, there's a lot of ways of how meekness works, and that's the beauty of being a meek individual, is that you're not weak, you're not powerless. You just are able to go from the degree of super strength to the degree of super sensitivity. Okay. And so the Bible talks about Moses being a meek individual, you know, one of the meekest men on the planet. All right? But when he saw somebody else beating up on one of his, his fellow, what did he do? He went out there and he took him out. Right. So, Are we supposed to turn the other cheek? Huh? Are we supposed to turn the other cheek? You you do. That's part of meekness. You 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 do turn the you do turn the other cheek when it doesn't matter. Now here's a good example. Um, did you drive yet? Yeah, I was driving so much. You drive. Permit. You have a permit. Okay. Well, you you'll get to see this at a lot. So you're driving, and then somebody just cuts you off, cuts you right off. Now, this is where you turn the other cheek because, see, what you, what you want to do, I'm going I'm to tell you what you're going to want to do. You're going to want to run up on them, go around and cut them off or do something. You're gonna, everything in you is going to want to have a retaliation. But what you do is you, you turn the other cheek and say, you know, go on. Why am I going to mess up, get angry the whole day for something that took two seconds? I'm going to let two seconds of somebody else's stupidity make my whole day upset. No, I'm not. I'm going to let them go. I'm going to turn the other cheek. So therein is the aspect where you turn the other cheek. But then remember also that the same person, Jesus, that said, turn the other cheek. When he went into the temple and saw them uh, selling it and turning the, the temple into a, 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 a market, what did he do? He took, he took, a, he took a stick. People often, often forget that first. He took his staff. And he, yeah, he threw up the table. And he also was swinging that staff. <laughs> See, he was swinging that staff. And so you needed to get out the way. And so people, when they paint Jesus, they always paint him looking all uh, in, 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 in feminine and all skinny and bony and everything. I don't think Jesus looked like that. I think Jesus was, you know, I think he was a you know, pretty, pretty solid dude. Yeah. All right. And so when he went in there and started throwing them tables and swinging that staff, no black skin. You saw, <laughs> you saw, you don't see nowhere in there where Fine. somebody else came and tried to. Wow. No, everybody what got out the way. Mm -hmm. So turning the other cheek is an aspect of applied uh, a spiritual action that we have to do in situations where turning the other cheek is applicable. So. There are times when you do that. Now, to go back to that same example, and I, I, I like using that example because it is, uh, to me, it makes sense. The Doberman Pinscher, when the kid that knows no better is pulling the, the Doberman Pinscher's ear, well, he don't, want, he don't want his ear being pulled. But for whatever reason, that dog has been trained enough that this kid is part of the household that I'm here. Somehow the dog understands that. And what he is doing when, he, when that kid, he's actually turning the other cheek. He says, I'm just going to let it happen. You can pull him all you want because you don't know no better. And so there are aspects when you do it. But then for whatever reason, that Doberman Pinscher that is trained right knows that it, you know, at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning when somebody's coming in through the window, that's somebody that I want to sink my teeth into deep. You see what I'm saying? So there's a reality to, yes, you do turn the other cheek, but it's not a, it's not a blanket statement because there are more things in the Bible besides what? 
turn the other cheek. There are times in there where the Bible says that we are to do things and do things on a more forceful aspect. And so it's important to understand that because people, especially people that are not saved, will try to use your spirituality against you and try to take advantage of you. Well, you think you're Christian. You, you, or I thought you was a Christian. If you were a Christian, you would help me. No. I'm a Christian and I love you and helping you is only going to hurt you. So people didn't want to get money to go do drugs or something. No. No. Me helping you right now, me helping you the way you think I'm supposed to be helping you will only hurt you. Well, if you love me, you, you, you're you supposed to be a Christian. I'm supposed to be, you're supposed to come and help me. You're supposed to give me. No, 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 I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not giving you. Because, because I love you, I'm not going to give you. Because all you're going to do is destroy yourself even further. All right. Because I love you, I'm not going to let you stay out to 4 o'clock in the morning. You ever thought I would? No, you cannot stay out to 4 o'clock in the morning. Why? Because I love you. See, if I didn't love you, I'd let you go out there and do what you want to do. Come in when you want to come in. Yeah? But because I love you, I want to know who you hang around with, where you're going, which, which, where you're going to be. That's because I love you. If I didn't love you, I'd say, well, you go do what you want, come in what you want, hang out with whoever you want to hang out with. Now, if, if, if you have children and you tell your children that, you don't love your children. Listen, my aunt daughter, she died. Her daughter was locked at 4 o'clock. And you ain't in the house at 4 o'clock. You going to be sleeping anywhere you want to sleep. She tell you to sleep right in her hallway at her door. Mm -hmm. But you got to have, you, when you love a person, you do want, and love is not always a situation where you are just letting somebody pull on your ears. The little person that knows no better, sure. But the people that know better and should know, no, you don't do that. And so you always have to keep that in mind. So, uh, yes, we do uh, restore each other in meekness, but that doesn't always mean, meekness does not mean always just, a, you know, a tissue all the time and a pat on the back. All right? Sometimes it means a kick in the butt. All right? And we got to always remember that. Look at two. Bear ye one another's burdens. Uh, and uh, so fulfill the law of Christ. All right. So therein is the direct contradiction. Two says, "Bear ye one another burdens," and verse five says, "Every man should bear his own." But people think that's a contradiction, but it's not because what he's talking about in connecting verse two to verse one is spiritual aspect. Verse verse uh, uh, five, he's talking about the things that you can do from a natural standpoint. All right. And so we should keep that in mind. Look at verse three. For if a man think of himself to be something when he is what? Nothing. Nothing. He deceives himself. And that happens. There are a lot of people that deceive themselves. I, I, I'm this and I'm that. No, you're not. You're not there. You're not that. And so you've got to be able to be what? Real with yourself. And sometimes you do need somebody else to tell you. Because sometimes you be thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm all this and I'm all that. And, and you got to be like, no, no, actually, you're not. You, you, you are here, even though you think you're here. Mm -hmm. All right? And so a lot of things are only a, a, the way they are until you happen to compare them to something that is actual. Now, for instance, you see, ever, ever see a white cat or, or, or a white dog? And, you know, you look at him and say, well, what color is that dog? What color is it? Oh, it's white. And you think, you say, okay. That's, but then when you, if you take a snowy day, when the snow falls from the sky, the snow is, is pure white, right? Mm -hmm. And then the dog or the cat goes next to that, that snow, all of a sudden, that, the dog or cat looks kind of dingy white, don't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. all right? Because now you're comparing it to something that's even better. So sometimes when you think something is so white or so, so, so clear, but then when it stands next to something that is even clearer, you begin to recognize it ain't as white or it's, it's not, as, it's not as, as pure as I thought it was because I can compare it to something that's even more pure. And so it's important that we keep that in mind that um, no matter how well we think we're doing, always remember this, that none of us are perfect. None of us, and which is why it's important sometimes, be careful how we look at others. Because, see, the, 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 the man with the big ears can't laugh at the, 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 the other man with the big eyes. And the man with the big eyes shouldn't be laughing at the man with the big lips. And the man with the big lips should not be laughing at the man with the big forehead. You see what I'm, you see the point I'm making? Mm. And those are just physical features. But then there are other features mentally, socially, mm. you know, uh, 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 
there, there, there are uh, ways about people that are different. And, so, and am I telling you that there's nothing that people do that's funny? Yeah, there are some things that people do that's funny. And yes, you, there are some humorous things in life. But don't be um, always focused on looking at somebody that's got, this guy has a, a worse situation than me. And you're always looking at things that, are, that I'm better in because that makes you feel good. Well, I'm better than this, I'm better than that, I'm better than this, I'm better than that. And you compare all these people that, are, that, are, that have less than what you have, and that makes you feel what? Uh, Lifts you up. Be careful with that. Because the reality of it is, if you go and start grabbing other people, and all of these other people have things better than you, what does that do to you? It might make you feel what? Less. So if you stop comparing in that aspect and just realize that everybody's got positive, everybody's got negative, no matter to what degree. Some people got a lot of negativity, and very little positive. Some people have a lot of positivity. But the reality of it is we still got to pray and care for all uh, people, not deceiving ourselves. Because deceiving yourself is an aspect of not seeing yourself in the realm that I need the Lord Jesus just as much as this person does. And rather, there, there are people, you ever hear about people that, that drown in a bathtub? But then you see people that drown in, in the ocean. Now, look at the amount of water in the bathtub compared to the amount of water in the ocean. All right? Who, who is more drowned? They're, they're both the same amount of what? Water. It's, 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 when you drown, you, you drown. It don't matter how much water you drown in. If you're drowning in a bathtub, you drown. If you're drowning in, a, in the ocean, you, you still drown. So it don't matter to what degree. If you are, uh, if, if, if the Bible says you are a sinner, if you are a good, upstanding situ uh, 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 citizen, but you still are a what? Sinner. If you are robbing, thieving, uh, you know, burglar, murderer, you still are a what? Sinner. Which one of them people need Jesus? Both. They both do. Both sinner. That's right. They're both the sinners. Right? And so that's the point that you have to keep in mind. That helps keep you on a level keel. Because there are a lot of people that are doing some, a lot of devilment out there in the street. Because they, they don't know no better. They think the system's against me. Everybody's, nobody's giving me a job. Nobody's giving me, I'm going to go, I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, that's a bad direction. And we do need to go and try to help that person. And, and a people, person like that, sometimes you got to go and you got to help them in the spirit of meekness. You might have to show them a couple of teeth every now and then. You might have to growl at them a little bit. But they need Jesus just like what? We do. Just like I do. All right? And so that's important to keep in mind. That helps you from not getting yourself lifted up, which is what verse 3 is talking about here. All right, verse 4. But let every man prove his own works. All right? You got to do the things that the Lord has called you to do. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone uh, and not uh, in another. You see, the joy comes from not the fact that you are better than somebody else. The joy comes from you're doing what, what God has called you to do. Therein is your joy. That's what you should really be thanking God for. God asked me to do this and I did it. Not that, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not as bad as this person. Or I'm not as bad as that person. See, that, that's the wrong type of comparison because you can always find somebody who you think you, you're doing better than. But are you doing what God called you to do? See, therein is the issue. Right, and that's where uh, we have to make sure that we're working in. All right. Uh, verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. And see, and that talks about the aspect of the work and the walk that you are called to do. Nobody can do your job. See, whatever it is that God has for you to do, guess who was supposed to do it? You. you. So, whether it's something you need to be doing while you're young, something that you need to do while you're old, something that you're going to do for 50 years, something that you're going to do for five days, don't, whatever that it is, guess who's supposed to do it? You. you. You're going to have to do it. All right? And that's, that's the important aspect of what um, uh, what it means to walk in, in the spirit. The spirit will, will it, and you go, well, how do I know? 
I don't know how you're going to know, but I will say this. If you follow the Lord and you pray and you ask him, you will know. Now, whether you want to accept it, whether you want to do it, that's another, another issue. But God will reveal itself to you and you will know. It'll come. You'll have confirmation. It will come. Will, will you know from, you, you'll have some kind of supernatural uh, experience, possible. Maybe you'll have confirmation from other people. God told me that you are, you are, you know, you this and you, and you get that confirmation from three or four other people. And, but the reality of it is, in your own what? In your own heart, in your own spirit, you will know. You will know. All right? And so I have no formula for anybody other than the aspect of what the Lord says. You, you seek after him, and he will let you know what it is you're supposed to be doing. All right? Um, a lot of people don't believe that. That's why we've got a lot of books being sold. God's will for your life. And you go read this guy's book about God's will for your life. And so the reality of it is you just need to find, you find God, he will tell you what to do. All right? Simple as that. All right. Verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. All right? So we ought to do what? We ought to teach. We ought to do the, the instruct. Show the things which God is doing. The things that we're doing doing right now. We're helping one another. We're sharing our experiences. We're asking our questions. We're, we're, doing, we're, we're you know, dealing uh, with the things of God in his word with one another. And uh, this is what we are to, to be doing. Look at verse 7. Be not deceived. All right? Now we already talked. We already saw up here in verse 3 that you shouldn't think more of yourself than you ought to think. Deceiving your what? Yourself, right? So now on verse 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he also shall reap. This is important to keep in mind. Right? You're not going to get over. We talked about this before. Nobody gets over on God. Right? And from a natural standpoint, See, you're not going to say, well, you know what? Since I'm taking on God's righteousness, it don't matter what I do. How good a sinner or how bad a sinner I am, when I take on God's righteousness, I have his righteousness. And that is true. But it does matter the spirit and the attitude that you go. If you come in there saying, well, I'm just going to sin because I know God's righteousness is going to cover me. What did Paul say about that? He said, God, what? God forbid. Don't do that. He said, don't, don't do that because you're going to end up being lost. You're going to end up... Not making it to heaven doing that because you were not going to trick God. So then he says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man saw, that also shall he reap. From a natural standpoint, you still pay consequences for doing things. You know, you, you go out there and, and say, Well, you know what? It don't matter. I'm just going to get drunk and just, you know, because I know God. Well, you know what? Your liver is still going to have what? The consequences. You can ask God to forgive you, and guess what? You can get, you'll get you know, uh, the forgiveness, but your liver may still suffer the what? The consequences. All right? All right? The Bible, you look at, look at uh, you go back to, one, uh, to chapter, chapter 5, and look at, look at verse uh, 19, right in the middle. It says, uh, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. All right? So you can go out and say, well, you know what? God's righteousness will cover me, but I'm going to go out and I can still, I'm going I'm to commit adultery. I'm going to commit fornication. You may still be able to repent and ask God for forgiveness, but you still might what? Get AIDS. You still may get the venereal, the venereal disease. You, you may get, still may get uh, pregnant. You still may follow a child. All those things are, are what? Works of the, flesh. of the flesh. And God says, you're not going to fool him. Look what, he, you can't get it any more plain. He said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. In other words, God is not somebody that you can just, you, you, you can mock and tease. Ha, <laughs> God, look, give me your forgiveness because I'm going to go do this. It ain't happening like that. And God is like, if you do that, you are deceiving yourself, brother. Sister, you are deceiving yourself. You need to just you need to put a check on on what you're thinking, and I, but this is what Galatians is all about. What what are you thinking? Who has bewitched you? All you know, who, he's talking to these Galatians like guys. You guys are loony. 
Have you lost your common sense? He, you know, he says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh, this is verse 8, for he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. You're not getting over on the Lord. No matter what anybody tries to tell you. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You see? So when you, when you sow spiritual things, all right, so it's important to keep in mind. You can't just walk in, 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 in the sin of this world continuously and think you're going to come away without getting the mud on you. You, you, you are not going to walk through the swamp and come out dry and clean. All right? But now God can give you a brand new set of clothes, and everything, but you still got those dirty clothes. Right? Yeah? Don't change the fact that you were in the swamp. So the forgiveness is unrelentless. God will forgive everything. There is nothing he cannot forgive. All right? But you don't want to take advantage or think that you're going to get over on God because you're going to reap what you what? Sow. What you sow. Look at verse 9. And let us be not weary in what? In well doing. See, now here's the other aspect because you start sowing. I'm sowing, I'm sowing, okay? Because see, here's the other thing that gets us down. I'm sowing in the spirit. I'm sowing in the spirit. I'm sowing in the spirit. I'm doing this, doing that. I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. Okay, you, you look. I don't see anything. <laughs> Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Do this. I've been doing this. Do this. All right. Years go by. Years, months, years, decades go by. You know, a decade go by. I did this. I did this. I did. I'm doing what I know is right. I go look for my rewards, and I don't see what anything. What, what? So what are you supposed to do? Well, let's go back and read this again. It says, uh, "But he that uh, uh, soweth to the spirit." shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Verse 9, And let us not be weary in what? Well, well doing. For in what due season ye shall what? If, if we faint not. So when is due season? Anybody know when due season is? We don't know. Due season is when it's due. See, see, and that's the beauty. See, he didn't say in six months. He didn't say in six years. He, he said in what? In due season. Now, can I give you the, uh, 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 an example that's extreme? God told Abraham when he was a young man that he was going to be the father of what? Many nations. Now, when you're a young man, you know, God, and, and God comes and tells you, you're going to be the father of many nations. He says, go look at the stars in the sky. Count them. Your descendants be more than that. Go, go look at all the sands on all the beaches. Go count them. Your descendants more than that. So you would think, rational kind of, would think, wow, I'm going to have a whole lot of what? Children. Children. All of a sudden, you know, Two days go by, three days go by, you know, wife's not pregnant. Okay, well, a couple months go by, okay. A couple years go by. They still ain't got a single child, not one child. But walk in the Spirit, you will reap in what? Due season. All right? Don't get weary, don't faint. All right? Decades start to go by. 10 years, 20 years. 30 years, 40 years, 50, I still don't have a child. Now, because you share your vision that God has given you with somebody else, and your wife knows, and the wife says, you, you, you sure God told you? <laughs> you sure God told you you're going to be the father of many nations? It's, you, ain't, you ain't got that child. So, you know, and I'm just ad-libbing here, but the reality of it is, so now what happens? We start doing what we do. We're going to start manipulating and changing it. I'm going to fix it. So I tell, you know what God must mean? This is what it must mean. Let me tell you something. It means exactly what it says. When God said that the Antichrist would be able to know when you bought a bag of potato chips 
across the world, when he said it 2,000 years ago, when nobody knew anything about internet and nothing like that, it meant exactly what it means today. So when Sarah came to Abraham and said, well, you know what God must mean? He must mean that you're going to have a child through my handmaid. It's still mine. So, so, so she, she's getting deep. Sarah's getting deep. She, she, she's going back into the Greek and to the Hebrew. The reality of what God meant was that it's just not through me, but because everything that belongs to me is part of me. Mm-hmm. And so because that's mine, that's my handmaid, and that handmaid is part of me, when you go into her and she belongs to me, that child will be through me and belong to you. And so... so, so she, she got deep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know what Abraham said? He said, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so he went into Sarah's handmaid and she conceived and brought forth a child. But that was not God's plan. That's not what he said. And God allowed it to happen just like God allowed all the stuff to go on today. People tell you, you in order to be saved, you got to believe in Jesus. And you got to speak in tongues. That ain't, and, and I used to believe that. I was I was down on that at one point, and then I then I, I said, I, "Well, we got that." I kept reading the word. I said, "Wait, it don't say nothing like that." Could the Bible even say, "Do all speak with tongues?" Being rhetorical, no, they all don't. So I used to believe that when I first got saved. Yeah. And um, yeah, I did. But thank God I got out of that. Well, I wish you was my brother. <laughs> I'd be able to be on And the reality of it is, we start tweaking it, adding mm-hmm. stuff to it, and, and messing up this, just putting, putting, putting fly in the ointment. When God knew what He was talking about, but we keep trying to change it, and so that that, and then the thing that you change becomes a hindrance to the actual what, the true blessing, because. And then, so, and then even after that happened, God let more years go by. More years go by. And then finally, God sent Abraham a visitor, an angel, came to visit him and told him that this time next year, your wife will conceive. And Sarah heard it, and what did she do? She laughed. She was like, huh, conceive? Are you absolutely you crazy? I done been through the I done been through the change and everything. I done, I done had all that. It ain't happening. You got to be, I, I know enough about common sense in life that I ain't having no children now. But see, when God says something, that's why I said, if God says this is a different color than what it looks like to you, you better believe God than rather than believe your own eyes. Mm-hmm. All right? God told you, this is going to happen. And the next year, she, was, she conceived because he was a child of promise. Mm-hmm. And so... The reality of it is that what God says, you will reap in what season? Due season. season. And the thing is, and then it says, you will reap in due season if you what? Faint Faint not. not. That means you, see, there's an old saying, uh, winners never what? Never quit. And quitters Never 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 win. See, the whole aspect of what makes you win is the fact that you, I, I, I didn't stop. I didn't give up. I didn't say, oh, I, put, I don't put too much time in it. Then you were never going to win in, uh, at all anyway. It was never going to happen for you. Even when you first started, it was never going to happen because you had a limit as to how hard you were going to put uh, your, your confidence in it and how hard you were going to go for it. So you, you, when you started, you failed because you didn't really start with the aspect that this is going to happen and, it's, and, and if it takes a month, if it takes a year, it's going to happen. I don't care. I'm not going to let little difficulties stop me from getting what I want. So what is difficult? So what if it takes a long time? So what is hard? And that's, I know what I want. I know what I want to do. I know what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm going to do it. All right? And so you're walking in the things of the Spirit. All right? And you're following the, the things of the Lord. And then you can just keep continuing to do it. It don't look good. And people, will, when things don't look good, the thing that you got to watch out for is just like Sarah. And, and could you imagine Abraham going around to the, to the neighborhood council, sitting around there, and he's sitting in there, and here comes Joe and Ben and, and, and Mark and, and Mike and, and, and Tyrone, and they all come around there and talk about, yeah, man, I just, yeah, got, a new, got a new baby now. Yeah, my wife is doing next week. And they, every year he's sitting around in the council, everybody else talking about 
how their wife getting ready to have a baby, another baby. Oh, yeah, we got, yeah, what that makes me? Oh, I got seven now, seven, seven, seven wonderful. You know, just, just, <laughs> just sit there, and Abraham, and they just sit there, Abraham ain't got nothing to say. He's just sitting there. But you got to wait. Right. And so sometimes you just can't quit. Because see, the difficult thing a lot of times is you, if, if you had to wait, you know, but then people start talking to you. They start talking to you. God said you're going to have how many children, Abraham? All right. And how old are you now? 90? And then, and then wait until he got what? 100. He waited not a decade. He waited a century. And his wife was how old? 90. All right, so, yeah, if we faint not, you need to, we need to underline that, triple score that. You just can't quit. All right, you see some of these people, you know, you listen to some of these people who, who, who make, it, make, make it big in businesses and stuff, and they tell you, that, well, the thing, that, the reason why I got here was because when I should have quit, quit, I didn't quit. When people were telling me, you should just give it up now, I didn't what? Quit. I didn't quit. All right. Verse 10. And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto what? Some men. All, all men. Especially unto them who are of the household of what? Faith. Of faith. All right? And remember, we do good to all people, to all men. And remember, doing good, we go back to the Dortmund pension. I like that. Some people, you let them take, yeah, he's taking advantage of me. He's, yeah, that's okay, but he don't know better. There will come a time when, when they know better that I won't let him pull my ears and stick his hands in my eyes. And other people, you do what? You show them your teeth. But you're doing it out of what? That's the right thing to do. That's how you are supposed to act towards that individual. Mm -hmm. All right? Some people, you just sit there and let them pet you. Other people, you growl at them when they are going in the wrong direction. That's how you, and you're still doing what? You're helping. Because see, the Dolman Pincher attacking the burglar is actually helping the what? The burglar. Because you need to stop your what? Stop your skin. <laughs> it's a help. And so I'm helping you by, by sinking my teeth right on into your legs. I'm, 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 I'm actually doing you a favor. And he can't understand it, how, how he's helping him. All right? The, whom the Lord loveth, he what? Chases. If God never corrects you, you need to go get saved. You better chase your spirit. That's what I'm right. So, verse 11. You see how large, now here's Paul writing now, he's closing up his letter. He goes, you see how large a letter I have written to you in my own hand. Now, one of the things that's important about that statement is that there were a lot of forgeries of Paul's writings. And so Paul, towards the, towards the end of his writings, had to, had to, at the very end of his letter, he would write. And one of the reasons why it was difficult for him to write, we believe, uh, not 100%, we don't have 100% proof, but it certainly does seem that way, is that Paul had an eye problem. And he may not have been able to, uh, to see very well. So therefore, when he wrote, he had, he had to write in big letters. But that was expensive because parchment back then, we, we didn't have paper like we got now. We, we take paper, when we're done with it, we crumble up, throw it away. Mm -hmm. When they, they had parchment, that was sheepskin and stuff like that. Then they, that was expensive. Yeah? And so when you, when you wrote, you wanted to write as small as you, because you can get as much as you want on that. On that. So was, and so when Paul had to write, he had to write in big letters so he could read it. Read what he's writing. And so it was expensive for him to write. So he had to, he always would hire, it was cheap for him to hire somebody else to write for him. Well, since they knew that Paul hired other people to write for him, that, mean, that meant that no one could identify Paul's writing in the beginning, specifically by the what? By the handwriting. Because they could say, oh, Paul dictated this letter to me. And I'm writing it to you. But it was a, actually a what? A forgery. So towards the end of his ministries, as he started writing some of these other letters, he started writing the letters, and then he would sign it. At the end, he would sign the, uh, the, the farewell conclusion in his own handwriting, and he would use the big letters type of thing. So you would know, this is an actual letter from me, and not one of these ones that people say I wrote. All right, so that's, that's why you'll see that. Verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh, they uh, constrain you to be uh, circumcised, only let, uh, uh, lest they should suffer persecution of the cross of Christ. 
And he's basically concluding with this. Don't get caught up in this aspect of people that want you to be what? Circumcised. Because that doesn't add to your salvation. It only is something that people would, would, would want you to do. So they can say they have a, a convert. All right? Uh, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. You see? So even the people that they go out and do it, they don't themselves don't keep the law. But desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh, pun intended. So they want you to go out and get circumcised so they can say how many, or look at how many different people. I went there and I, and, and, and 90 people got circumcised after I went and took. They do that today, don't they? Well, we, I had, a, I had an altar call and 90 people, it don't matter. It, it, it don't, it just, we, we should not glory in our what? They're trying to glory in what? In their flesh. In their flesh. 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the what? In the Christ, in, 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 in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm going to glory in anything, I'm going to glory in the fact that I'm saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's my glory. All right, that's the only thing I can glory in. By whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Jesus Christ neither... There is neither circumcised avail of anything, nor nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. The only thing that's important is, are you a what? New creature. That's the only thing that's important. All right. Verse 6. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be unto them, and mercy upon uh, the, the Israel of God, the, 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 the children of God. Who, which we are. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the what? The marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he mean by that? It means that he got beat, he got whipped, he got stoned, because he told people the truth. And people don't want to hear the truth. Now, let me just say this. In America, it will happen. The, the, you're going to be, we're already at a point that we, if you, what would happen if you walked into the school and you had a, a t-shirt? See how this t-shirt right there? It says what? Happy, happy camper, right? Now suppose you got a t-shirt and you said, Jesus saves. And you walk, you start walking to the high school, to the middle school. Do you think, and you wear like every, you know, every other, other, every other week you, you wear that t-shirt. You think somebody's going to say something? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You gonna shake the devil, man. That name is powerful. All right. So you can't. You you can walk, but yet you 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 see people walk through through the high school with skull and crossbones, with yeah. you know. They don't say nothing. They don't say yeah. nothing to them. But get one that says Jesus it's Christ more, saved. More, Jesus. More, more. You get anything like that and walk through the school, and I guarantee you they're gonna ask you not to wear that. Now why? It's offensive. It's it's offensive. Offensive. They say that you know they, that your religion shouldn't be practiced in school. Yeah, but they say that job too. But but the reality of it is is that okay. it, it, it's what Paul is saying here. He says verse seventeen. It says from henceforth let no man uh, trouble me, for I bear my right. And then he says uh, the, uh, the the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. These things, and he he has those marks because. People are offended at his preaching. So his marks were whips and stripes on his back, and, and, and the fact that he was stoned because they didn't like what he said. That is happening to us now in a small way here because they just say, "Okay, you can be a Christian, and you can we can have this little gathering like we got right now, sitting mm -hmm. around talking, and that's fine. But don't I don't want to see it." Don't show show it to me. You you keep it undercover, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But it's going to get to the point to where even this right here is going to be deemed terrorist act. Because the thing just and I'm going to tell you right now where it is. That statement that Jesus said, where he said, "No man comes to the Father but by me." That is ex that is exclusive, and they're going to say that is intolerant teaching. And if you believe Jesus is the only way to heaven, you're walking in a uh, 
a, a, a way of thinking and a, and a way of believing that is detrimental to the unity that we're trying to create. And in Christianity, we will be labeled a terrorist. Now, they already have the terrorist template set up. And you see how quick they can change, take one group of people and turn them into suspects globally. When 9-11 happened, anybody that had on, what do you call a them, turban. a turban, you were instantly, what, looked at what, like, hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, saw, you saw one of them people walk around, and they did that on purpose. Mm -hmm. This is the world. Who is the prince and power of this, of, uh, of the air, of Same. this world? Mm -hmm. Satan. And, and when you talk about all this different stuff that's going on, he's the master conspiracy. He's the one that's doing all this stuff. And so that template has been set. Now you just have to be able to instantly substitute one group for the what? For the other. And Christianity is going to be one of those groups that's going to be slapped right in there. Why? Because the Bible said, people say, well, how's anybody going to, you know, how's the, globally the world going to be attacked by, if, you know, by being a Christian? And how globally will parents be turning in their children and children be turning in their parents? That's what the Bible says. Now, what people are going to try to try to do, well, well, let me tell you what it means. Don't listen to that. It means exactly what it says. We're going to come to a day where being a, a Christian, believing in Jesus, is going to be so offensive to some, to some people, to most of the people, that it's going to be deemed a terrorist faith, a faith that, that is a detriment to the construct of what they're trying to put together, which is this whole new world order thing. And we will then be told that if you're going to believe in Jesus, then you are going to have to change your belief. You're going to have to confess that there is other ways. Other people can get to heaven besides just Jesus. And if you say no, then you will be, like the Bible says now in the tribulation, what's going to happen to people that do that? They're going to be put to death. Now, we thank God we have not got to that point yet. But in other countries, go to some of these African countries. And if you don't believe me, look up, look up Christian uh, uh, torture globally. It's happening in some Muslim countries. Oh, yeah. It's happening in, Af in some of these African countries. It's happening in China. Mm -hmm. See, it just hasn't happened in America. And the thing is, nobody's putting that on mainstream news. Mm -hmm. no. no, but they they, they doing um, FINA camp. They're setting up over they're here. All over. And they they do. say they're doing it at Camp Smith mm -hmm. that nobody knows. And that's why mm -hmm. I be telling people in that break room, I said, God, let me tell you something. Y'all sit here and look on Google if you want to. The army come here and say, where's the manager at? I know my exit. That's why I told Gabe, I ain't playing with him. When the summertime come, we're going to walk from here to, to Peekskill, and that's the way I'm coming. Well, now what she just said was, was very, very true. They, 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 are, they, they, have, they have created FEMA camps, mm -hmm. and there are FEMA camps. Okay. Now, Spit. why are they building these things? And they, are, they, they, have a, they have FEMA camps. They have over 70, the last time I checked, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. over, 70, over 70 FEMA camps. Now, the thing about the FEMA camps, what they're saying is, well, these are supposed to be for when things happen, like Sandy or 9-11. We have places to put people. But then you go look at some of these FEMA camps. <laughs> they look like jails. Like jail. And they barbed got wire. the barbed wire. The barbed wire is not to keep people yeah. out. The barbed wire is tilted the other way yeah. to keep people yeah. to keep you in. Yeah. Now, when the why would the government waste billions of dollars to build these FEMA camps? And every state has one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and some states have two and three. And if you go back, you go back to, to Germany. See, this has been done already. Yeah. All right. And then in Germany, what did they do? They took, they told all those Jews, we we we're gonna move you to safe haven because there's a war going on, and we need to move you to some safe, safe pl places. These are nice camps that we're gonna move you to, and they moved them to these concentration camps where they actually did what? They killed them. So America is putting together. The, the, this chain of FEMA camps. That's why I say the end is near. Yes, right. We got them. And you sit there, and I, and I sat there, and I looked at that, and I go, I said, now, see, this don't make no sense. I said, now, they're not, they're not telling us on, on TV, but the fact that they have these FEMA, and they're spending 
millions and billions of dollars building these female camps, and they also are building. See, so I can go on and on. I'm gonna stop. In Georgia, they, like the um, people who make Georgia sneakers, they built it, and they have like, and um, they have like these huge like um, like sneakers that they sell in the caskets, like for people that, like you know, what do you call it? The things that they put people in when they die. Oh yeah, they have them like stacked up right. Oh, oh yeah, they 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 have those caskets. They not not. Not like dozens. They have thousands. Now, why would the government, I think I had mentioned that to you before, why would the government spend thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars for caskets and then hide them out in the woods, in the swamps in Georgia? They, they, you, don't, you don't spend all that kind of money for something. Well, we just got a bunch of money. What, what should we build? I don't know. Let's build some caskets. No. <laughs> They know that there's something coming up, that there's going to be some kind of, And if you, I, I saw this other thing on, on and, and a lot of stuff you find this on internet news, you don't find it on the regular news. Train and train, train after train after train after train of military trucks. Where, where are these things going? I thought the war was gone. I thought we were coming and bringing the troops, what, home. So there is something going on. And the thing about it is we do need to, to watch and what? Pray, pray, be aware, but at the same time, um, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't get in fear of, because Jesus says that don't fear him which can destroy the body, but cannot. Destroy. In other words, he said, "Be faithful to be faithful unto me unto what death." death. death. So you, what he's trying, what Jesus is trying to tell us, don't. Be fearful of the life. Death is not going to hurt the child of God. The devil tries to make us so fear to the point that where he thinks, well, death is will well, kill you. And Jesus says, don't worry about that. If they killed me, they're going to do what? They're going to kill you. And he says, but don't don't worry because it's not going to be what you what they try to make it out. Because the death of the child of God is just transition, and that's the faith and the confidence that we got to have in God and say, I'm not going to bend. I don't love my life more than I love God. I love God more than I love my natural life because my natural life is going to die anyway. Mm-hmm. See, that's the key. That's the thing. It's, if, it's like if, if, if somebody told you, I'm going, here's a million dollars. I'm going to either set it on fire or you're going to have to give it to somebody else. Now, if you give it to somebody else, they can do what they want with it. But if you don't give it to somebody else, I'm gonna do what? Set it on fire. What's the What's the best thing to do? Set it on fire. Give it to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> you give it to my family. You give it to somebody else. <laughs> All right. And so, and so, God is God is saying, your body is going to die anyway. There's nothing you can do that's going to what? Stop, Stop that Stop from happening. Happen. So don't fear if somebody says, if you don't do, if you don't do what the devil wants you to do, we're going to kill you. <laughs> Look, man, my body's going to die anyway. Mm-hmm. I ain't afraid of that. And but see, that's why you, you got to study the word because it ain't you just you just ain't gonna wake up one day and just say that. Mm-hmm. You got to have confidence and faith in what the yeah, scripture yeah. says, so that when the devil does his when he. You know, and so what I do pray for, I pray, I say, God, let your, you know, your kingdom come. But that's what he told us to pray, right? Mm-hmm. He said, let your kingdom come, your will be done on uh, earth right. as it is in heaven. I'm looking for the rapture to take place because I know I, I, it has to be close. And I go, Lord, yeah. let it happen. I won't be there. You know, because, because I can't, when I sit there and I look at the, the news that they have, on, and, I, and I don't, I don't, I don't uh, say a whole lot. I just take the information in. So, mm, that's interesting. That's it. And I throw a little bit of stuff out there. Like you can go out there and, and check out what they're doing in the Denver airport. Yeah. All right. Now that that don't make no sense. They sure. And they got all these underground condominiums that they're building. And why are they building all this? And, and they're all the rich people and the Queen of England buying buying uh, land over in Denver because they know something. That's, they're prepared. But let me tell you what they're prepared to do. Here's the thing about it. When I first started looking at this this whole new, I said. They're out to get people. I said, and then I said, well, why? And then the Spirit of God said, it's not, it's not people. It's not y'all. They're preparing to fight God. And then, I went, I, and then the scripture came to me of, of uh, Psalms 2. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it. Then we're gonna, we're gonna have to stop. <laughs> Psalms 2. And it says, it says, why do the heathen rage and the and the people imagine a vain thing? What what vain thing? Okay, look at verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves uh, and the rulers take counsel together. You know, like the Bilderbergers and the uh, Bohemian Groves and the Skull and Crossbones, all of them, the, the elite people, the elite meetings they have, against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from, uh, from, from, uh, from us. So this is what they're saying. They want to separate themselves from God. I don't want to have to listen to God. He that sitteth in the heavens shall what? Shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. In other words, they're not going to succeed. And then I was looking at what they're doing in the Denver airport and the millions and billions of dollars. This one construct construction guy who built underground condominiums. Did you hear what I said? I didn't say underground bunkers. I said underground condominiums because these rich people, they plan on living nice underground. And they're building the one over in Denver Airport because Denver is the mile high what? City. And so they figure if we were to have some kind of catastrophic thing, and a lot of them are at the point where they're able to control some of the weather because you want to do that, you can go look up hard. Mm. And um, they, they, they are trying to build these things. But let's take a look at, look at uh, uh, Isaiah 2. Chapter 2, verse 10. And it says, Enter into the rocks and hide thee in the dust for the fear of the Lord. This is what they're doing. Yeah. Enter, what, what chapter, what was that again? That's Isaiah chapter 2, mm -hmm. verse, 10. Oh, verse 10. And it says, Enter into the rocks and hide thee in the dust. Or in the what? The ground. Why are they doing it? For the fear of the Lord. So they're doing this to fight against God. And for the glory of his majesty. Go down to verse 19. You, know, we can read, you can read that whole chapter. But it says, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. All right? Uh, and, and, uh, and he shall arise and shake terribly the earth. So the fact that they're digging and, and, and building all these, these uh, 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 dwellings in the earth is not new. Isaiah wrote that thousands of years ago. That this is what they're going to do. They're trying to hide from God. And so when I looked at all this, I thought, well, they're building all this stuff. And, and one, the, construct, the construction guy that does this, he builds these condominiums. He said his biggest problem is that when that there's certain things that you have to get so you can have proper airflow and have proper lighting and everything down there and the proper generators. He goes, my problem is I can't get the stuff because the minute they, they come out, the government buys them up. So my problem is I'm, I'm, I'm behind in my construction because I can't get the, 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 the things that I need because the minute they, they come available, the government's been buying them. Mm. And the government is building more. And they also they built well, they more. They have one in Westchester. They got one in the White House. Yeah, I know. I know that. Huh? They got one down in, the, um, down in the city that a lot of construction guys talk about. I might have to but stop. But it's cats that take.